Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our event, Post Row Access and Equity. My name is Eva Brandstetter, and I'm a senior editor at ProPublica, and I'll be your host today. We're going to wait for a few more minutes for more people to join us, so thanks for your patience. In the meantime, uh, just some housekeeping. Uh, closed captioning of this program is available and can be enabled by clicking on the closed caption option uh, on the bar towards the bottom of your screen. Today, we're gonna to be discussing access and, and health equity post row. Uh, this is the second event in our three-part series of events surrounding uh, this issue to bring clarity to the, the state of reproductive rights in America. And uh, we're very excited for the panelists that we have today and, and for the range of topics they're going to discuss. And we're so glad that you're joining us. Um, you know, it looks like we have enough folks now uh, on now. So again, thanks for joining us and let's get started. <clears throat> if you're just joining us, my name is Ziva Brandstetter and I'm a senior editor from ProPublica and I will be your host today. Uh, welcome to today's section, session, Post Row Access and Equity. Uh, as I said, closed captioning of the program is available. It can be enabled by clicking on the closed caption option on the, on the bar in the bottom of your screen. And as an additional note, this session is being recorded and a link to the video will be provided to everybody who signed up uh, and registered before the session. Uh, for, those new, for those new to us, ProPublica is a nonprofit newsroom dedicated to investigative journalism. Uh, we uh, would be thrilled for you to check out the other work that we do on the site after this. Um, and today I'll be talking to two of our reporters and, and experts as well about abortion access and health equity um, post row and, and all the issues that you've been reading so much about. Uh, several <clears throat> so-called haven states are making headlines for taking steps to expand or guarantee access to abortion, and these expansions and guarantees are attracting residents from more restrictive states who are seeking out abortion care. So for individuals who are incarcerated, for example, who can't afford to travel or who come from uh, historically disadvantaged communities, access can still be difficult, as I'm sure some of you have been reading. Uh, even with added abortion protections, pro-choice states are, are not fully able to uh, counteract the effects of Roe's demise. And so uh, today our panel of speakers will shed some light on the question of access for groups who are commonly overlooked by traditional media. We'll also be answering your questions. We've had many of them already submitted and please continue to submit those during our program. We'll get to as many as we can. Um, to begin, I'd like to invite two of our own reporters, Jessica Lusenhop and Kavitha Serana, who have recently reported on the effects of Roe to help open up the uh, conversation. So welcome, Kavitha and Jessica. <clears throat> so I, I wanted to just briefly summarize the stories that uh, Jessica and Kavitha have done and then um, talk to them a little bit about their reporting so you can hear more about that. Um, we also have a call out uh, for people who uh, can't want to uh, let us know about how the bans on abortion across the U.S. Uh, have impacted medical care for them or people they know, situations they're aware of. And so we'll be dropping the link to that call out in the chat. We encourage you to um, submit any information uh, relevant to that call out. Um, so Jessica uh, wrote a story in um, August uh, about Minnesota and um, really look, a very fascinating look at the data that um, she was able to find regarding who's, who's seeking out and obtaining reproductive health care abortion in, in Minnesota. And um, it's a fairly diverse group uh, Minnesota of Minnesota residents, but what she found, and she can talk more about that, is those coming from out of state, uh, people of color made up a much smaller percentage on average of the patient population. Um, and then Kavitha's story uh, looked at how um, there, there was an incident at the border in which a woman from Australia was, said she had been questioned quite uh, aggressively about her abortion history and possible abortion history uh, and by the CBP uh, uh, and immigration authorities in the US side. So that raised some questions and the larger story uh, focuses on how uh, immigrants say that, uh, immigrant advocates say that these questions actually aren't asked often enough about women's health status when they're coming into the US, when they're in US custody, when they're being held in immigration facilities, that there is not enough attention to um, the need for reproductive health care. Um, so with that, uh, I, I guess I wanted to um, 
ask you, Jessica, you know, Minnesota is one of these so-called haven states that we mentioned at the outset, where abortion access is protected by the state constitution. So you took a closer look at these statistics that the state is keeping on, on who's receiving abortion care. Can you talk about what questions you were hoping to, to answer with that story? Yeah, I think that as somebody, you know, I am based here in Minnesota, I cover Minnesota. And so um, as a resident of a so-called, again, Haven State, I really wanted to, you know, Haven, that word kind of makes it sound like, you know, it's a, it's a pretty uh, bucolic sounding word. I just wanted to interrogate that a little bit more. Um, and I thought the data was a good way to do that, um, particularly, you know, uh, because I feel like I was reading a lot at the time about how abortion bans in other places are going to sort of disproportionately affect women of color. And that made me sort of want to turn that on its head a little bit and say, okay, well then who do, what do we know about pregnant people who are traveling to a place like Minnesota for, mm -hmm. for this care? Um, and um, each state keeps abortion data a little differently. And it turns out Minnesota keeps it in a way that we could um, sort of single out data that has specifically to do with out-of-staters. And um, as you said, it turns out that that the, the demographics for pregnant people traveling into Minnesota for that care differ quite dramatically from in-state residents who are seeking out the care. And so um, while in-state um, pregnant people seeking the care, it's a pretty diverse group, people who are traveling into Minnesota historically are overwhelmingly uh, white. Mm -hmm. And so that to me, again, this is data from um, before, from <laughs> it's backwards looking, but I just thought that it was interesting to at least sort of point out, here's what we know so far mm -hmm. about who's going to be able to travel into a state like Minnesota for this care. Great. And we're going to get into later with our panelists that issue of travel, who can afford to travel. Um, and for many reasons, uh, it's very difficult um, for, uh, lots of folks. So um, I think that reporting you did in Minnesota kind of foreshadows possibly the trends that we're going to see um, across the country. Thank you for that. Uh, Kavitha, you know, as part of your reporting, you looked uh, take a, took a look at reproductive health care access in immigration facilities. And uh, that's a context that hasn't been discussed very much in the news. So what did you uh, learn about how this has been handled in the past? And are we seeing any changes yet in that space since Roe was overturned? Or is it too early to say? Yeah, well, so immigration um, agencies are federal. So even though abortion bans have gone into effect in border states like Texas and Arizona, um, facilities located there are still supposed to operate under specific national detention standards. And those standards do currently guarantee access to abortion information and services. And the Biden administration has reaffirmed that. But um, advocates told me um, in discussion that, that, that they still see this as very tenuous. Um, now, there's a couple of different kinds of facilities that hold immigrants and asylum seekers, but I want to focus on um, one type um, as an example, which is shelters for unaccompanied children. Mm. And these are supposed to be temporary places for minors who come without a guardian to stay until they're released into to a family member or a foster family um, in the United States but sometimes they do stay for longer. Um, and there's limited data, but I was able to find in court records that between 2018 and 2019, um, 53 girls in those facilities asked for an abortion. Mm -hmm. And as context, just remember that for people coming to um, the US-Mexico border, the way um, to get here, the journey is through human smuggler networks and sexual assault is very common on that journey. Um, and, and in general, women coming to the United States, they're often coming to seek asylum because they're trying to escape um, gender-based violence, intimate partner violence, um, even within their homes. So um, I point out those facilities because there's a really instructive test case for thinking about what could happen in the future. Um, when Trump was president, uh, an appointee in his administration who all oversaw those shelters um, for unaccompanied minors tried to block girls from getting abortions and he sent them to um, anti-abortion counselors um, uh, funded by um, anti-abortion groups. Um, the American Civil Liberties Union heard about this and they launched a lawsuit and on the basis of Roe versus Wade, they won. But now um, they couldn't use that argument and these policies, they're not law, they're created by the executive branch. Um, so as one um, ACLU representative put it, 
to me, you know, if an anti-abortion president gets elected, then these policies are up for grabs. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the facilities records in general when it comes to reproductive health care issues? I mean, there, there have been concerns about the treatment of, you know, women who are pregnant and, and um, are these, these immigration detention facilities, what are their records in general when it comes to reproductive health care? Yeah, that's what came up in the story. And it's interesting because talking with advocates, it reminded me of how much this is all linked. Um, you know, I learned historically their concerns have focused on how pregnant individuals are treated in the detention facilities. Um, and there are many documented cases um, that have to do with um, lack of care or inappropriate care. Um, under Obama, uh, pregnant and nursing people, that was a group that got prioritized for release. So you could be released while waiting for your immigration hearing. Uh, Trump did away with that. Uh, Biden has brought that back. So ideally, there shouldn't be pregnant people in detention for very long. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, and, av and advocates maintain that that's because they can't receive appropriate health care there in those settings. Um, but um, immigration authorities, they can still detain pregnant people if they have some kind of past infraction. And so it's a space that advocates are continuing to watch and monitor and um, that we as reporters keep trying to learn more about. Great. Right. Thank you so much, um, both of you, for sharing your reporting. Uh, I'd like to invite our panelists to join us on screen. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm going to introduce them when they uh, join us. <clears throat> Hi, guys. Um, so Amy Hagstrom-Miller is the president and CEO of Whole Women's Health and Whole Women's Health Alliance. She's an independent abortion provider who manages clinics in nine states across the USA. Uh, Caitlin Knowles Myers is professor of economics and co-director of the Middlebury Initiative for Data and Digital Methods at Middlebury College. Her current work focuses on primarily on access to abortion care and and the effect of abortion restrictions um, and uh, or burdensome processes such as traveling to receive care or mandatory mandatory waiting periods on the incidence of abortion. So um, both of these uh, panelists have highly relevant uh, expertise to share with us today. And then we will have a third uh, a third. Um, panelists joining us, Dr. Carolyn Suffren. She'll be joining us soon. She's a professor of gynecology and obstetrics and director and uh, uh, advocacy and research on reproductive wellness of incarcerated people at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Uh, so she has worked extensively on reproductive health issues affecting incarcerated women for, from providing clinical care in jail to research policy and advocacy. So when she joins us in progress, I'll, I'll just... Uh, ask you all to remember her uh, her bio there. Um, so I wanted to throw out a question to all of you, both the both of you, and uh, uh, get your thoughts on it. You, you all have uh, pretty unique areas of expertise and interface with specific communities. So from where you sit, uh, what are your initial perceptions of how the ban and resulting changes have had an impact? And I realize there've been many, but sort of the, the um, biggest impacts that you see. Yeah, I'm happy to take that. I'm Amy, like um, you introduced me. Um, so it's had a huge impact. Um, and I think one of the biggest impacts is chaos, uncertainty, fear. Um, a lot of abortion seekers are very confused about their rights. Um, they're confused about where access could be. A lot of abortion providers are uh, afraid about criminalization and afraid about um, practicing the, the specialty that we're trained to practice because of people who are migrating from state to state, et cetera. And I, I wanna just point out that's exactly the intention of these kinds of restrictions is to create this um, landscape of uncertainty and fear um, and you know, make it hard for people to get access to safe abortion care. Um, more and more we're seeing two Americas um, emerge, um, which we saw even before Roe fell um, with disparities in healthcare access, but also with um, so many hurdles to get access to safe abortion. And now that 13 states um, have criminalized abortion and it's completely unavailable in those places, um, we're seeing those, those chasms grow even further. And many of the people we serve in abortion clinics, um, in my clinics at Whole Women's Health and many clinics across the country, most people are already parenting. Most people are working one or more jobs and they can't just pick up and travel hundreds of miles um, to get access to safe care in a different community. Um, kind of to Jessica's point that she was talking about from Minnesota, I'm a Minnesota native and Whole Woman's Health has a clinic in Minnesota. And I think one of the things we're seeing pre-Dobbs is very different than like the, the 
area she studied, studied in her report is very different with Minnesota reporting because prior to Roe falling, most of the people who traveled into Minnesota were coming from the Dakotas or Wisconsin where abortion restrictions were um, you know, greater than in Minnesota, but those populations are primarily um, white folks and you know, economic disparities are at play as well. Mm -hmm. um, even with SB8 in, enforced in Texas, we saw people traveling all the way from Texas into Minnesota. And as recently as August, when I was um, in Minnesota working with my clinic staff, um, we had about 15 patients in the waiting room. And I think 12 of 15 people were not from Minnesota. Um, and so I think we're seeing a big change post Dobbs than what we saw um, pre-June in the country. And you know, kind of the number one thing our patients are saying and, and abortion seekers are saying to us, first, they don't always know abortion is not accessible or legal still when they're calling in the place they may be calling from. And two, they want the next available appointment. Mm -hmm. um, once you're denied an abortion, your drive to seek an abortion and become unpregnant um, is even more great, I think. And so folks are not necessarily going to the closest place um, or the most um, accessible or logical place. You might say, oh, someone from Texas is just going to go to New Mexico. If they're told there's a wait of three to four weeks, they're going to figure out where to go next. Um, mm -hmm. And so we're seeing migration all over the country. Caitlin, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, so I think in some ways, Amy and I can really complement each other in painting this picture because that's a picture you know, that Amy has of, of what it looks like to be a provider on the ground right now. And for me as a data person and as an economist, I'm looking at it through a quantitative uh, and somewhat abstract lens. So I was thinking what I would do to try to illustrate these, these two Americas that Amy describes is share a new tool that I launched just this week. I'm gonna put it in the chat for folks if they wanna check it out. It's called abortionaccessdashboard.org. And I'm also gonna share my screen. So if you don't wanna check it out right now, you can sit tight and watch me walk you through it, but it's gonna, I'm gonna show you an image of those two Americas. Mm -hmm. So this dashboard relies on data that I collect and maintain on the locations of all U.S. abortion facilities, and I update those data monthly right now. In addition to updating those data, I have a team of 25 undergraduate students at Middlebury College where I work who have been conducting mystery calls to collect appointment availability information at all U.S. abortion facilities. They've been doing it monthly. We're switching to quarterly. And I'm going to come back to this landing page in just a second. But I want to actually go over to a different page that has a slider that shows you how the landscape of access has changed since Dobbs. So this image that you're looking at right now is a map of the United States, of course, and every census tract in the US, which is like a pretty small I think, neighborhood like area is shaded according to how far you would have to travel to reach the nearest abortion facility and where you see uh, where you see the darkest green, it's less than an hour. Where you see light green, it's one to two hours. And then where you see pink, we're starting to see higher travel times. Mm. All of the little blue dots that you can see here are the abortion facilities that were open on March 1st in this country. And what I'm gonna do is just show you how the landscape has changed since Dobbs. So this is the current landscape of abortion access in this country. Right now, we're in a scenario in which 13 states are enforcing total bans on abortions that have closed all of the providers in those states. That actually glosses over some complexity related to, for instance, Georgia's six-week gestational age ban or a flickering of bans in states like Arizona where they are, they're in effect, they're not in effect, that have actually caused some providers to to give up and shut down. So there's other losses in access, but you can see just with this slider that we have this portion of the country in the deep south and the Great Plains that has experienced tremendous increases in travel times so that a large number of people are now more than seven hours from a provider. Now I'm gonna go back to the main landing page, which just shows you the current state of access because there's a few other things I wanna say about how access is changing through this quantitative lens. So we're back to the present uh, with more information. So right now we have 13 full bans being enforced and even accounting for providers that have moved across state lines to continue providing services, we still have had a net loss of 62 abortion facilities since March 
due to these, mostly due to these bands. You can see the long travel distances. You can click on states to see summary statistics. For instance, in Texas since March, the average distance to the nearest abortion provider has increased from 44 to 500 miles, and the average travel time from less than an hour to more than seven hours. You also, though, can begin to explore what access looks like if you can reach these providers. Because in what some people are calling haven states, we have providers that are experiencing a huge influx of patients out of the banned states who are seeking abortions. Mm -hmm. And it's likely to put a lot of pressure on them to meet that demand. And so in the app, if you click on any of these destinations, you can explore both the travel routes showing you where people are coming from for whom, for instance, Wichita is their nearest provider. And you can see that in Wichita, they've had, there's two facilities there. They've had more than a 2000% increase in the population of women in the region that they would serve. Of course, not all of those women stay in Wichita. In particular, if they're seeking abortions there, one of the facilities didn't have any appointments available within two weeks when we called in September. So they're also struggling to meet demand. You can similarly see in other places, for instance, if I um, zoom in on, oops, that was the wrong one. If I zoom in on Kansas City, similarly, they are only one of the three facilities uh, was able to meet demand when we called. And that's true, not only in the cities that are kind of the most obvious direct destinations, but also in states, for instance, like Colorado, that are just receiving a huge influx of people from places like Texas. And in Colorado, for instance, if we look at Denver, only half of their eight facilities had appointments available within two weeks when we called last month. So I'll stop my share there for people who would like to explore the landscape of access. Clearly, you can look at the state of your choice. But what I would say from a quantitative perspective is that these state bans are opening up enormous inequities in access so that a large fraction of the U.S. suddenly finds themselves hundreds of miles away from providers. But that's not the end of the story because even for people who live in the locations where facilities remain open, those facilities are struggling to meet this new demand. Fascinating. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, showing us that tool and, and the data, I think, is really important. Uh, I'm just thrilled to say that we're joined by Dr. Carolyn Seffrin, uh, and she is a professor of gynecology and obstetrics, and as I said, director of the of advocacy and research on reproductive wellness of incarcerated people at Johns Hopkins um, University Med School of Medicine. So she focuses a lot on on some of the issues we're talking about, um, access issues uh, affecting incarcerated women. So I just want to recap the question for you, Dr. Seffrin, and that is just sort of an opening question to all of, all of the experts, what your initial perceptions are of the biggest impacts of, you know, the overturning of Roe, um, you know, big, biggest changes and impacts that you're seeing. Well, um, thank you so much for that question. And thank you so much for, for having me. I'm honored to be here, part of this conversation with wonder, wonderful co-panelists co as well. In terms of what we are seeing in, uh, as to how this is affecting incarcerated people, the answer to that is we don't know because we know so little about what is happening behind bars in our country. They are the least transparent institutions despite being publicly funded um, institutions. So what I'm about to say is what I anticipate we will see or what I anticipate is likely happening based on research that my team has conducted and based on experience that I've had work, previously working as a healthcare provider um, in a carceral setting and also now working in the community as an abortion provider. So the first uh, thought uh, that I had when this um, was not when Roe was overturned because we all knew this was coming, but as we saw this coming down the hike, the first thought I had was this impacting incarcerated individuals' abilities to access abortion, because for those people who are incarcerated in states where abortion is banned or severely restricted, they do not have the freedom of movement to travel to another state. Now, of course, so many individuals in abortion restrictive states cannot travel because they, as we've heard and as we know, the, they cannot, um, it, the, the getting together the logistics and the financial means to do so is challenging. But for people who are in prison or jail or other institutions of incarceration, they categorically do not have the option to even try to arrange to travel to another state. 
Mm -hmm. um, this also is true for people on probation and potentially or people on parole and also probation, right? There are limits to where they can physically move because they are still, they may not be behind bars, but they are still under state control. So their ability to seek an abortion when they need it is um, by definition constrained by the state's control of, of their lives. Mm -hmm. um, now, this is certainly also going to have an impact on incarcerated pregnant folks needing abortions who are in abortion supportive states um, because of the influx uh, from, of people from out of state and the strains that we're already seeing on people in state. So even in those prisons and jails that are in states with, um, with that have access to abortion providers that have supportive laws, it's going to be incarcerated people who feel the effects because they don't have control over their scheduling. Um, there's there are already barriers in place in those states, um, and so to understand what the impact um, on abortion access for incarcerated individuals might be like, um, really also under that requires understanding what was it like before June twenty fourth. Mm -hmm. And the answer again is it depends. It was highly variable, not simply on whether it, someone was in an, a state that was overall abortion supportive or overall abortion restrictive, but it depends what prison or jail you are you are in in that state. So from a legal perspective, pre-Dobbs, the legal record was very clear that incarcerated individuals retained their constitutional right to abortion. This was established through um, through several case laws. I wish I could say numerous, but um, but several cases that established this precedent that um, removing a person's uh, constitutional right to abortion did not uh, serve any what was called penological purpose. Mm -hmm. And so they maintained that right to abortion. Um, and that was also consistent with um, the right that all incarcerated individuals have um, to act to health care based on a 1976 Supreme Court case, Estelle versus Gamble. So the courts have affirmed that abortion falls under the health care that, that was required um, for prisons and jails to provide. But in practice, it did not look like that. And our research team has studied this extensively, um, both through evaluating policies, abortion policies at prisons and jails. And this has also been done by, um, uh, by researcher Ra Rachel Roth, who, who um, surveyed prison, state prisons about their abortion policies. We have also done that um, and also with jails. And what we found when it comes to policies um, that uh, in our study of 22 state prison systems, uh, while most of them did allow abortion in uh, in at least the first trimester, only half of them allowed it in both first and second trimester. Um, and even at the ones that did allow abortion, most of them required the incarcerated individual to fund the abortion themselves. So mm -hmm. this was even in a state where Medicaid might have otherwise funded abortion. And you're incarcerated, Medicaid is suspended, so you can't access that benefit. You can't really access any private health insurance while you're incarcerated either. So functionally, there were a lot of barriers, even in abortion supportive states, mm -hmm. even in a state where, um, where abortion is legal to viability, um, a prison in one of those states only allowed abortion up to 14 weeks. In, in contrast to the state the state law. And prisons and jails could get away with this because no one really pays attention to those policies. Then when we also looked at how many abortions are occurring in prisons and jails, we, um, we collected prospective data for one month from these 22 state prison systems and from the five largest jails, um, most, of, most of which are in um, abortion supportive states, California, New York, and Illinois, but two of which are in Texas. What we found in the jails um, is that 15% of the pregnancies that ended in jails um, ended in abortion. So that was similar to, um, to national abortion ratios. Um, but in the prisons, um, in the state prisons of the 800 or so pregnancies that ended in one year in prison, there were only nine abortions. Wow. Nine. Um, and two in the federal system. So 1% of the pregnancies that ended and did an abortion. Um, and this was a quantitative study, so we couldn't fully explore the reasons why. We, we have followed that up with qualitative data. Um, and although those haven't been published, one of the striking findings of that study was that most incarcerated pregnant people just assumed they didn't have a right to abortion. And it was a very casual assumption. It was just, oh, I just thought I didn't have any rights. Mm -hmm. um, so the the store, the situation with abortion access for incarcerated individuals before June 24th was already 
uh, fairly abysmal, and already fairly variable. And the variability is important because, you know, the jails like Cook County, LA County, Rikers Island in New York, um, the individuals there did have access to abortion. But I started this by saying, um, you know, that I was initially concerned with access to abortion. The situation was already grave. It's going to get worse. The marginal difference, it's unclear how much. What I'm also concerned about is the ripple effect in um, unincarcerated people in terms of other pregnancy care in these systems that are already ill-equipped to provide comprehensive pregnancy and postpartum care to this population. It's fascinating. Um, uh, yeah, I, I just wanted Caitlin and then Amy to talk about the effects of, of you know, these so certainly for incarcerated people, as Dr. Severin told us, it's almost you know, it's a very bleak situation, but the um, barriers to travel, um, can you all talk about the effects um, of distance on, on people? Yeah, so um, I'll start because this has been the focus of a lot of my work in recent years is isolating and measuring the effect of travel distance on abortion obtainment. Mm -hmm. And the way we do this in my very quantitative field is we rely on what are called natural experiments. So if you're interested in how distance affects people, you can't really run like a randomized controlled trial, for instance, as you would for a drug test, because I could not ethically or feasibly go out into the population and say, oh, if you want an abortion, you have to travel 25 miles. And if you want an abortion, it's 300. And now I'm going to see what happens to you, right? So that is not an option for scholars. But what we can do is use situations where sudden changes in access have as good as randomly assigned distance for us. And we've had several of them in the last decade coming from uh, various state level uh, supply side restrictions that have suddenly shuttered providers. This happened in Texas in 2013 when a law closed half of their providers pretty much overnight on November 1st. It happened with some laws in Wisconsin and we've had other contexts to examine it. And so what we've done in my field and it's my work and that of others is we use publicly available data on abortion and birth rates, and we measure as distance goes up, how many people still get to the providers, how many people don't. And if we see people not reaching abortion facilities, what happens to them next? Do we see them give birth? And what that literature shows is that distance has a tremendous effect on people seeking abortions. And that an increase from zero to 100 miles prevents about a fifth of people who want abortions from reaching providers. And that initially, when, when economists like me started um, disseminating that result, there was a lot of surprise in our field, but also, for instance, in federal courts, where this was really important to measuring the burdens of abortion restrictions. And kind of the pushback we would get is like, oh, if abortion is so incredibly important to somebody's life, they're going to figure out a way. And it's it's such a class lens through which somebody views healthcare access, because as Amy's described, as Dr. Suffren's describing, um, people who are on the ground in this field talking to folks seeking abortions are not surprised that distance is such a barrier. Mm -hmm. And so based on what we've seen quantitatively in the literature, my best estimate of what is likely to happen due to the unfolding bans is that about a quarter of the people in the affected areas are going to be trapped primarily by distance and poverty. For those people who get trapped, some of them are likely to self-manage their abortion, to find another way. Mm -hmm. But based on what we've seen in the data, at least in the last 10 years, about three quarters of them carry to term and give birth as a result. And mm -hmm. so just in terms of numbers, I think that's generally the magnitudes that we should be expecting <clears throat> to be look at, looking at barring other policy interventions, um, maybe huge success for abortion access funds or mail order medication abortion, which we can talk about. But I'd like to hear Amy's perspective. And, and if she thinks that number sounds uh, realistic, I'm curious to know. Yeah, I appreciate this. And I will just say that um, it's so important to study the data that you all are studying and, and publish the data and the impact. Um, I sit and listen to real people impact, like tell the stories of the impact and, and my staff do, and I can't even begin to quantify um, the trauma and the difficulty of having people who are completely trained to perform abortions and dedicated their life to the service to now have to answer the phone and deny people that care. And measuring that impact on the abortion workforce 
and on folks who have been trained and are ready to help. And now they're serving as sort of travel agents um, and trying to like tell people what flight to take and what car to use and how to get to someplace um, when there's absolutely no reason but for these politics that they can't provide the care themselves. I also think there's no other medical procedure in this country where we tell people, oh, you just drive 700 miles, right? That is a procedure that a third of the population will have at some point in their life, right? Abortion is incredibly common, it's incredibly important, and it's time sensitive essential health care, which I know many of you understand. But I think we have to look at the ways in which the opposition is trying to de deny people care outright, delay people's ability to access care, which drives up costs, which drives up risk. Um, which also makes the abortions they finally are able to obtain abortions that less people are comfortable with, including the patient, right? This is all part of a strategy. I think we need to just always remember to tell the stories of the people that are impacted and listen to what's happening to people as they try to build their families and they're forced to either continue a pregnancy they don't feel ready for financially, emotionally, in their family, um, or they have to seek to self-manage their own abortion or they're forced to travel. Those are really, I agree with you, those are sort of the three paths that we're seeing people um, talk about. We're also not seeing people to care, to Dr. Suffren's point, like it's hard to measure people when you can't, they're missing, right? Their data doesn't matter, they're missing. There's not a clinic anymore in Texas where you can talk to the patients, right? Like there's no there there, right? And so I think a lot of what's happening right now is disappearing. I want to point you to the turnaway study from UCSF um, that, that measures, um, Diana Green Foster, that measures um, what happens to people when they're denied the abortion that they seek. And it, it, it measures sort of the impact in people um, over decades. Um, our clinic in McAllen, which has now been, been shuttered by these laws, was one of the participants in that study. And I think it's a really timely, um, timely data to look at. The other thing I would just point to, um, thinking about what um, Kavita was talking about before, is that the, the Jane Doe that had the abortion in that the ACLU fought for um, in McAllen out of a detention center had her abortion at Whole Woman's Health in McAllen. And um, Dahlia Lithwick tells the story through Bridget Amiri's eyes at the ACLU in her new book, um, Lady Justice. So I just recommend reading that. It's a pretty powerful story. We started a program at Whole Woman's Health called the Wayfinder Program, which literally, it's like a super literal name, like we help people find their way. Um, to an abortion um, when they've been denied an abortion. And, and that program started actually all the way back when Governor Abbott used the COVID pandemic to, as an excuse to ban abortion in April of 2021, and, <laughs> April 2020. And then um, it got sort of brushed off, unfortunately, and, and reignited when we had to deal with SB8. Um, and so it's been a program that has grown exponentially now that abortion is banned in so many states. And, and what we're doing is basically trying to help people from places where abortion has been criminalized or, or where it's been restricted or banned, um, find their way to a place where they can get safe access to abortion. Um, and with abortion funding, um, both for the traveling as well as for the actual procedure, but also just logistics of trying to find where's the next available appointment to what you were talking about, Dr. Myers, to like um, what clinics are open, what clinics can see them. Um, one of the things I will say as an independent abortion care provider, which means that we're not affiliated with Planned Parenthood, is that independent providers don't have a national brand like Planned Parenthood does in some ways. And so when you lose the independent provider in your community, right? Like, you know EMW in, in Kentucky, you know Red River Women's Clinic in North Dakota, you know Whole Woman's Health in McAllen. Those folks don't know what how to search for that kind of clinic mm -hmm. in Kansas or Colorado or Illinois because they don't know the name, right? And so I think there's some independent providers that may be available to meet surge demands. Um, and we're just trying to figure out ways through either the abortion finder or I need an A or some of these listservs to, to get people access to places where they may not have to have as much of a wait time. Mm -hmm. Other thing that's fun to just, because I have two researchers on here um, and probably way more people listening also. Other thing that's really been interesting is just that the migration isn't of people isn't necessarily following proximity like I touched on a minute ago. And we're seeing this with our Wayfinder program. People are going, to places where they have an uncle or they have an aunt, I have a friend I can stay with. I, maybe I went to college there, maybe I grew up there, or, you know, people are picking where they go for their abortion and it's not necessarily just the closest. Um, and I think it has a lot to do with travel. It has a lot to do with economics, people feeling safe, um, knowing where they can go, a familiarity. I think also when we have so many people who are primarily black and brown, 
driving cars with license plates from Southern places. We need to think a lot about where those folks feel safe hmm. and welcomed and protected, where they can blend in, right? You may um, be able to blend in a little more easily in St. Louis than you can if you drive to some little town in Southern Illinois where, you know, Carbondale, where somebody's opened a clinic, right? Or you may feel more comfortable going to Albuquerque than you would to go to Hobbs, right? Or you may um, feel more comfortable in Chicago. And, and I think we have to think about safety of our patients because our patients are being profiled and surveilled and followed. We have to think about safety of providers and we have to think about safety of the staff because now the anti-abortion forces have um, fewer places to focus on. So we're seeing an increase um, in, in some of those, the vitriol from people who are emboldened by this win and are now gonna cross over the border from Texas into places like New Mexico or Illinois and try to sort of foment um, the sort of red voters in a blue state is some of the words that I've heard people use. Right. Right? So um, I, I brought a lot of stuff into that, but that's a little bit of what we're seeing and what we're trying to navigate as we try to support people um, to travel into places they may never have gone before, they don't know anything about, um, a lot of our patients have never flown before. They don't have an ID. They don't, they've never been through airport security. So we've built this whole like guide for them that's like, isn't he, doesn't even use words or language. It has pictures. Like this is what the metal detector looks like. This is what the thing looks like. This is how you do this. Because um, so many of our patients, um, you know, haven't, haven't done any of this kind of thing before. And then the first time they do, it's, it's in the context of, of seeking an abortion. It's a fascinating perspective on the ground. Um, really appreciate you sharing that. Uh, I wanted to just have each of you talk for a few minutes. Um, we are gonna go to audience questions um, near the top of the hour. So um, I wanted to have each of you talk for a few minutes about the equity issues at play. I know we've talked some, right, about um, people um, who are incarcerated, you know, people who wind up in immigration detention. You know, we've talked about some various communities, a few communities we've talked about today, but there are so many that should be overlooked in terms of access. So what communities have you all noticed have been overlooked by traditional media uh, that should be part of this conversation? Who are, who are you, uh, I wouldn't say most concerned about, but who, who do you think is really being missed and, and really being challenged? And Dr. Suffering, if you could go first. Sure. Well, um, I think I've somewhat already answered that question with yeah. incarcerated individuals. It's um, uh, they are forgotten um, because it, our society has created a system that makes us believe that <clears throat> prisons and jails are over there. Um, but it, it, they're part of the community. And in fact, if anything proved that um, uh, uh, to a, a very strong point, it was the COVID-19 pandemic, right, where we saw rates skyrocketing behind bars, and it was because of flow to and from the community, from workers and people leaving and and and, um, and coming. So I think incarcerated individuals is a population that we absolutely must pay attention to for so many, excuse me, for so many reasons. Um, all of the disparities and inequities in abortion and other pregnancy care and uh, reproductive health and supporting the well-being of families, all of the disparities that we know exist in this country already that track along racial and ethnic lines, um, those are also true of incarceration, right? So um, Black women are incarcerated at twice the rate of white women. Um, mm -hmm. Indigenous women as well have um, significantly higher rates of incarceration um, than white women. It's, uh, uh, same with Hispanic women as well. Um, that's how the uh, Bureau of Justice Statistics reports their ethnicity. Um, so the disparities that already exist in abortion care and in other pregnancy and reproductive health care that tracks with um, who is incarcerated in our country. And when it comes to all of the um, you know, inequities in pregnancy care and, um, and the broader ways that our society doesn't support certain um, individuals and certainly certain families from thriving, um, it's people who are incarcerated. Um, so I think we absolutely need to pay attention to what's happening to them. Um, I think we're going to probably see more pregnant individuals behind bars in this country, um, just based on um, you know, the number we're potentially going to see, likely going to see more pregnant people give and birthing people in this country. And so I anticipate that more of them will be um, incarcerated as well. And these systems, as I mentioned earlier, are ill-equipped to deal with them. And then they're, um, if they're forced to give birth and give birth while in custody, they're then forced to be separated from their newborn. So they're denied the right to have an abortion, and they're also denied the right to, um, to parent. 
So this is a, a huge issue of inequity and injustice um, and uh, one that we absolutely must pay closer attention to. Thank you for that. Uh, Caitlin. Economists aren't known for being emotional, but I'm, I find this description really hard to hear. Um, but I measure things. So I can tell you that in the literature that uses quantitative methods to isolate and measure the effects of abortion restrictions, we have seen the same story, the same, the same dominant story for 50 years, which is that abortion restrictions disproportionately impact people of color and young people. We saw it when abortion was legalized 50 years ago, Roe v. Wade didn't make abortion accessible to everybody. What it did was dramatically reduce the inequalities of access. People with means, primarily white women, um, middle-class women, upper-middle-class women, they had been finding ways to obtain safe abortions even if they lived in places where it wasn't legal. It was people who, black women, young women, people were, who were more marginalized in society who faced much more difficulties. And what we saw with the legalization of abortion it dramatically reduced births, particularly to teens. It reduced teen motherhood 50 years ago by about a third. It reduced black maternal mortality by somewhere between 20 and 40%. Mm. It had huge effects on young women and women of color. And that's what we're gonna see again right now. We see it in all of the current literature on mandatory waiting periods, on parental involvement laws and on distance. The biggest effects are for young women and women of color. And for me, I think, on the one hand, I think, you know, you kind of asked if, if what the press is missing. I don't necessarily think that journalists are missing that fact. Um, and, and that's a good thing. I see it covered. I see people talking about it. <clears throat> but it's also interesting in the economics literature, in the economics world, um, I so often get questions about the economic impacts of these policies where people uh, ask me, okay, well, are businesses going to leave the South? Are they gonna have trouble recruiting workers in the South? What is the political kind of pushback gonna be? And, and one of the things that I find a little bit troubling about those questions is I feel like sometimes there's this failure to recognize that people who can choose where to live and where to have jobs and, you know, are like professors deciding where they want a professor, those are not the people who get trapped by a lack of abortion access. They find a way to travel. Um, and so I think sometimes we're missing just the extent to which this is an inequality of access story. Great. And uh, Amy. A couple of things. I mean, my colleagues have covered so many brilliant things. A couple of things I think reporters are missing. One of my favorite, one of my favorite questions. Um, I think reporters are missing talking about abortion as an economic issue, especially in the context of the election. I have seen reporters, I just, you know, saw Steve Pernacki like, analyzing the, the election um, last Friday, and he separated economics from abortion and told the story like abortions fall into number five and the economy and inflation is number one. And anybody who understands like why people need abortions, why family needs access to safe abortion, how access to safe abortion has improved outcomes in mental health, family health, economic justice, et cetera, would, would not separate abortion from an economic issue. So I think it would be really cool to see some reporters dig into that um, because I think, understanding the reasons people need abortion and what safe abortion does for family outcomes and women's health outcomes and all these things is really important. Um, two, I think uh, there's a struggle, I think, with some reporters that I have talked to, to um, deal with that, that there isn't sort of a heroic arc. There's no narrative. There's no narrative of us being able to say, we're going to sue. We're going to get an injunction. We're going to, we're going to get a TRO. We're going to fight back. We're going to bring this to Supreme Court and then we'll win. We've been able to tell that story for a long time. Whole Woman's Health sued the state of Texas no less than 11 times, right? And we won a few times. And so I think that piece is tough. When I talk to reporters, sometimes they're like, but 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 they, they want to have the answer to the questions that they ask me be a different answer because mm -hmm. they're having trouble accepting that some people are going to be forced to carry pregnancy to term. Some people are denied abortion. Yes, this is real. Um, there is not this heroic arc. And I think we have to be careful telling sort of like we raised thousands of dollars to help somebody travel hundreds of miles in order to get an abortion that took five days. That's not that's not heroic. That's a tragedy. Mm -hmm. Right. And so we have to talk about abortion in a different way than I think we've gotten used to, right? Because we're used to this sort of 
fix or the legal system is going to save us and, or the you know executive branch is going to write an EO or you know I mean we're in a very different you know we just got a president who said abortion for the first time like feels like two weeks ago right and so I think we, we're in a different place where um, you know the relief we're we've gotten used to with providers suing and getting injunctions to block things um, is not there anymore and mm -hmm. so I think it's a really new a new framework and I, I want um, I want more complex stories to be told that aren't so black and white. Um, and before we go to audience questions, I just want to follow up with you, Amy, and talk about what it's like to have to both close down clinics like you have in Texas and then ramp up clinics, you know, in <laughs> other places mm -hmm. while you're fighting battles in Indiana. Like how, how are you, you know, able to sort of juggle those two things? Yeah, it's been a really tough time, not only for our team at Whole Women's Health and, and you know, having to close down the, the clinics we had in Texas, you know, which is where we started, um, and also try to get ready for a surge um, and or, or just keep stability in the clinics we have in Minnesota and Maryland and Virginia and see these disparities, depending <laughs> upon where people live, continue to emerge. Mm -hmm. um, and it's two, you know, two different sides of the same sort of skill set, trying to figure out how can we prepare to help people travel and migrate and how can we deal with the trauma and the injustice of having to, to close those clinics? Um, and that part's been really challenging. You know, people saying things like, well, why did you close? You know, <laughs> wow. reporters ask me that a lot. And I'll say, you know, we were forced to stop doing the work we loved, right? Mm -hmm. like, like people want you to own like, oh, somehow a failure in the provider, right? That we weren't able to figure out how to stay open or we're not able to figure out how to help people get the care they need. And I think, that piece is really important for us to, to examine, right? This is a community, a societal challenge. It's, it's, it's much broader um, than any one sector of us can, can fix right now. Um, so, you know, we're grateful that we're able to see um, patients in some places, um, but it's been very difficult to figure out how to help people get the care that they need um, and just listen to the stories of the, the desperation uh, of people who can't even begin to think of how they're going to travel uh, across the country to get the care they need. Um, right. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And um, just um, for all of you, for your, the wisdom that you brought to this discussion and um, I want you to stay around. We're going to have, obviously, um, we're going to turn now to the Q&A portion uh, with our audience. But before doing that, I'd like to share a link to our event survey in the chat box. And we really would appreciate your feedback for those of you who have joined us today. Um, again, if you'd like to ask a question, please click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen and submit it to us. We'll get to as many as we can. Um, now for our first uh, submitted question, um, I wanted to ask a question from Allison Herrera, a colleague of mine here in Oklahoma, about um, access for um, Native women. And uh, she notes that this tool, Caitlin, that, that you uh, showed us is incredibly useful to map out access. She's wondering if you or if any or you all are aware um, how the law has impacted Indian Health Service and those who seek their care at those facilities. I wish I had an answer that wasn't a fairly short no, um, but but that's that 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 is the, the truth for me. I can, with the data I have, I can or I can provide anybody who's interested. Because I'm very much about open science with the data to map and quantify uh, changes in access at any spatial level. But I have not specifically studied how it's impacting. Uh, Indian Health Services, and uh, we do know, as I said before, that communities of color rural communities, um, they are often disproportionately impacted by, by closures. Okay. Um, and so our next question is, do you have any advice, any of you, for um, healthcare social services providers serving young people, uh, BIPOC people of color, incarcerated people, and how to, you know, keep complete and accurate charts that won't be used against them? Uh, Dr. Seferin, you probably have some advice for this uh, in potential criminal um, actions. Um, well, I would say I'm also a, a healthcare provider um, and an abortion provider, although I practice in a, an abortion supportive state in Maryland. Um, but what what my colleagues and I, um, not only in Maryland, but across the country are advocating doing is just recording the medical facts. Um, and, you know, if someone comes in to the emergency department pregnant and bleeding, that is, you just need to evaluate that um, the bleed and document 
that that they're bleeding and what you're doing to stabilize them, but not anything that led up to that. Um, you know, whether they uh, because of potential for criminalization of self-managed abortion in certain states, but you take care of them as you take care of any other patient who comes in with those same symptoms um, and uh, documenting the medical facts of the case. Mm -hmm. Anything to add to that? Amy? Yeah, I would add to that. That's, that's super important. We've been doing that for years. I would add to that, that um, it's not a crime to help people get the abortion that they need in the state where abortion is legal. And I think people are really afraid and have been grown, like I think the aiding and abetting part of SB8 got everybody worried, right? Mm -hmm. But we're, we're, we're post SB8 now, right? And, and, it, and there's many states where abortion is legal and people from any place <clears throat> can go to those states and have abortions that are legal if they can get there, right? And so I think there's a lot of fear about, can I tell people that, that, that abortion is still legal? Could I tell someone in Texas how to get to somewhere in New Mexico or Kansas? Could I tell someone from Ohio how to get to an abortion in Michigan? Yes, right? And I think the more we can just let people know that you can provide information, that you can, um, you can give people that information, I think that sort of pre-compliance piece that we're seeing or the fear, um, I, I want it to not grow more than it needs to, right? Because there's enough misinformation already. Um, and so just hope that we can encourage people to, to give information. It's not like the, you know, the international gag rule or something, right? Like, like abortion is still legal in many places and um, Texans and Mississippians and Louisianans can be seen in those, those places where abortion is legal, just like people who live there can be. Great, thank you. Another good question. How effective are travel funds in getting people to doctor's offices? Uh, Caitlin, you wanna take that? On? Do you know? I'm waiting to measure. Um, they're changing like the, the entire, the amount of funding they have, their organization, their scale is all changing right now. And so I'm not, I, I think we're gonna have to measure what the, what the total effect is, but I do have a few thoughts on it. One, I have no doubt that just, just from the qualitative evidence alone at this point, that they are assisting people in obtaining abortions who otherwise would not have been able to. Two, I also have no doubt that there are large numbers of people who remain trapped by distance and poverty for whom the travel funds aren't a, a viable way out. First of all, as Dr. Suffren's um, discussing, like the travel funds are not necessarily any help at all to an incarcerated person. Mm -hmm. There's that but other people are trapped by other circumstances that aren't just about the lack of funds for travel. It's about figuring out how to take time off of work, figuring out how to get childcare, mm -hmm. sharing it, doing so may involve sharing information with people who, um, you know, might pose a risk of violence to the person seeking an abortion. So what we've seen in the data so far, there've been travel funds, by the way, for a very long time. Like, so our analysis of the number of people get trapped um, has always been in the context in which travel funds existed, and we still saw large numbers of people trapped by distance. So, you know, I think uh, we'll continue to analyze the effectiveness of those funds, but they're not going to meet all of this uh, unmet demand and unmet need. There's some questions about um, security, anonymity, the surveillance, um, and you guys may not uh, have a lot of specifics on that, uh, on this issue, but I wanted to ask it um, regarding, you know, tools for people, how to, how to maintain their anonymity, how to protect themselves from potential legal action. You know, there's another question about tracking uh, telemedicine and mail forwarding to restricted states. Is there anything? Um, you yeah, that's a, there's a lot there. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, I think that as far as the travel funds go, I think it is helping people travel, especially gas cards. Um, more than sort of flights kind of mm -hmm. stuff. Um, but I think you're right that not everybody can travel, right? So it's like a little, it's a little bit of both, but I think people are um, very much helped. And, and if there aren't travel funds, people continue pregnancies or self-manage. I mean, it's a direct relationship. Like they can't come up with it necessarily. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot in this question. I think there is some surveillance. What, the surveillance I was referring to is people... Um, being profiled, like people who are traveling together, like let's say you're driving from, you know, through West Texas onto Albuquerque, right? Um, I think people are sort of, um, you know, there's anti-abortion people who are saying, we're gonna like, you know, if two women are traveling over the border, et cetera, right? I don't know if that's being encouraged, but I've heard patients talking about that and worried about that. We've also seen, um, you know, there was the, the person who, 
you know, was talking about abortion in Facebook Messenger and that that information was used against them. We've seen that um, also that kind of electronic surveillance. Um, I think, you know, anti-abortion people are emboldened, they're not gonna stop, right? And so I think we, we can't um, assume that, um, that those kinds of things aren't gonna be surveilled, but we also have to realize that abortion is a moral good, it's a social good, that, that it's essential medical care and it's available and people still need the access to safe abortion, right? And so I think um, the fear about criminalization and the sort of pre-compliance as that sort of, you know, one of the first signs of authoritarianism, right? I think we have to balance that, right? Because the more um, we can talk about it and, and almost stand in a place of pride if you're in a state where abortion, access to safe abortion is protected as essential medical care to say, welcome to Virginia, welcome to Maryland. We are proud to be here. We will to help you, right? Instead of this sort of like, oh, we better be careful nobody finds out, right? Mm -hmm. I think it, sometimes it's a matter of, of how bold we want to we want to we want to be in the places where it's supposedly safe for us to do so. And to me, that's part of what it means when people say haven state. It's not just it's not just a haven state, right? Like we have we have a responsibility as part of this country, right, to be of service to the people who who need us from other parts of the country. Mm -hmm. um, go ahead. Could, could I just add a, a thought that it is a huge question. So I'll add a, a thought that's from a different perspective and something I've wrestled with professionally. So one of the big questions that all the quantitative people in my field are just waiting to be able to answer is what the net effect of all of this will be on abortions and births. And to answer that, we're really waiting for several years uh, for vital statistics to be released that we can analyze. In the meantime, everybody's trying to figure out if they can get a sneak peek at what's going on and they're adopting different strategies. But one strategy that several teams of researchers are adopting is to buy data from location data brokers. So yeah. everybody probably knows this, but um, if you have apps on your phone, a lot of them are tracking where you are. And those apps sell that data to location data brokers, which collect it and then they sell it to other um, companies that use it for all sorts of things. So as an academic, I've had undergraduate students last year for free obtain information that counts of the number of people showing up at US abortion facilities. And you know, you don't know, you don't have the individual data on the person, but you know how many people are there, what days they came, where there, what other places they went that day. And the brokers have the detailed data, which they sell. And mm -hmm. so there's this huge, first of all, there's an ethical question for me about whether it is ethical to use such data. I've taken a public stance that I won't use it, but I think it's a really difficult, I think it's a really difficult question and I, I'm not uh, necessarily condemning the people who are using it for academic research. But also for me, it raises this huge question about the potential for surveillance via, via people's phones. I mean, this isn't actually hard to do. Um, the, to my knowledge, none of the brokers are providing the data to government agencies that might want to surveil people seeking abortions. And to my knowledge, that's not like happening, but it's definitely an area where I watch the role of technology uh, in, in what's unfolding with a decent dose of anxiety. Interesting. Um, we had another question about indigenous uh, communities and the, and the challenges that women face to, you know, get um, even just basic OBGYN care. So I guess I wanted to ask Caitlin um, and, and any of our panelists, if you have advice about um, the best sources for people to help track inequities for future research. Um, you know, there's some journalists on our um, panel today. There are people that are just very uh, avidly interested in this issue. So are, do you have any recommendations, um, sources of information to track inequities? I would just chime in with a couple of organizations like Indigenous Women Rising or Sister Song that have um, a commitment to do work with Indigenous women, because I think there may be people tracking things more than, um, than we realize, right? So just trying to like, Make make that encouragement. Um, I, I know from the maps that that Caitlin shared and maps that I've been staring at for the last year and a half, right right over here on my wall, similar. Um, that you know, if you look at where a higher percent of population of Indigenous folks live, um, those states have had abortion spans. And so um, I think you know it's probably um, an issue that some of the the 
specifically dedicated to Indigenous women and Indigenous repro work, um, some of the orgs might be dedicating some thought to, mm -hmm. and that's not represented here in our panel. Okay. Um, let's see, uh, there was a question about birth control measures spiking up as a result of these restrictions. Um, I don't know, Dr. Seffern, if you could answer that. Is, that. is that at least easily accessible in these regions? Not necessarily. It depends. Um, access to contraception is highly variable. It it what it always was, um, uh, depending on you know general access to reproductive health care. But um, we're also seeing uh, there are also concerns about regulation of contraceptive methods because of um, uh, misinterpretation that they are abortion methods. Um, I, I've already heard anecdotally of a, of a jail in a um, in a, an abortion restrictive state that now um, does not provide emergency contraception. Um, so, and that's that's an example from a jail. But I think there there are also going to be challenges with contraception access, even um, in in community settings as well. Great. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and close our session today with the final question. Um, and we've talked a lot about a lot of resources and, and re you know, research you can direct people to, but do you all have any additional research or resources that you would like to direct our attendees to after today's session? Groups, uh, anything like that. Where can people go for help? Uh, the Guttmacher Institute is always a good go-to source um, of uh, as much real-time data as, as we can get, um, and they frequently update their, their website. Um, so I would say the Guttmacher Institute. Mm -hmm. And Kate, Caitlin, your, um, what, your tool that you showed, how, how can people access that? Yeah, well, first of all, I just have to second Guttmacher, who um, does an incredible mm -hmm. job of disseminating timely public health data. I'll put the link to my tool again in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm tracking and updating um, monthly right now, uh, changes in bands, changes in travel distance, changes in appointment availability, and you can go to my tool to obtain those data. Also for scholars, you can download uh, county and month, uh, or sorry, county and state level measures of access. And I've also got links to other open science uh, data sets that I publish that can be used for academic research or just describing. I think the other thing to just pay attention to is um, in the academic community, we're all analyzing the effects of these changes in access right now, right? Like, so my dashboard describes how access is changing in a quantitative way. Mm -hmm. But the next step for us is to analyze and then what, what's happening to people. Right. And so I would simply say, stay tuned. We're waiting on the data to be released. I'm working on some projects right now on, um, on mental health, for instance. Fascinating. I would add a few things. I would give people um, the Abortion Care Network, um, which is an organization of independent clinics across the country. And the Abortion Care Network has a, has a fund called the Keep Our Clinics Fund, which folks can donate to, which is actually um, giving direct access to independent clinics across the country to keep our doors open or to transition our services if we have to shutter our doors um, and to really just keep those lo logistics available to independent providers. Another web, another org I would point people to is the National Network of Abortion Funds, which is helping people uh, with resources to pay for their abortion and also resources to travel. And then, of course, um, our Wayfinder program, which is housed at Whole Women's Health Alliance, which is doing similar work, both in services and helping people get access to abortions in places where it is still available. Thank you so much. Um, that's our time for today. I, I did want to close with just a note for our listeners that um, ProPublica, we are measuring issues that impact um, Americans and um, with data and with uh, the, the approach that we bring uh, to any journalistic enterprise. And so we're not taking a position, but we are um, looking at where um, issues are impacting um, people all over America and how we can measure that. And so the, this discussion has really been about providing this information for everybody out there. And there's a wide variety of opinions and, and feelings about this um, this issue. And uh, I think we've captured today how, how, how this issue has really impacted some of the most vulnerable communities in America. So I, I just can't thank you all enough for joining us, to our panelists, to the reporters, and to our audience for joining us for some really thoughtful questions. Um, just wanted to remind everyone again that this event has been recorded and you'll um, soon you'll receive an email with a full video of today's event. And we'll also post this recording on the ProPublica YouTube channel. 
Um, we encourage you all to join our last session in this three-part series and uh, be the first to know about the program by visiting our events page, which is propublica.org backslash events. And uh, from all of us at ProPublica, thank you so much for joining us. Have a great rest of your evening and see you next time.